Okay, hello everybody and uh, welcome. Uh, great to see such a big turnout this fine morning. <laughs> How are you all guys doing? Yes, perfect. I, I knew that. We're doing good too. So yeah, uh, my name is Jaakko Haapasalo. I'm head of studio at Rovio Entertainment. And with me here today is also Mauricio Holando, Hello. senior programmer at Rovio, and uh, one of the guys responsible for making bad piggies happen. Uh, there's a couple of things we'd like to talk to you about today. Uh, first, bad piggies, what it is and uh, how it came to be. How we came to create a game like this and how it all came together. And of course, the closely related question of the technology we chose to use. And uh, I guess I'm not spoiling anything if I say that uh, we decided to go with Unity and that it worked out pretty great for us, but uh, a bit more on that later. And the second thing we want to cover is really the process of iterating and finding the core gameplay of Bad Piggies, having to do mainly with the kind of core set of gadgets and all the amazing contraptions you can create with those. Maori is going to go into a whole lot of detail on that later today. But um, I would actually like to start out with a bit of a movie that should get everybody in the right mood and maybe even thinking just a bit like a bad piggy because this is the kind of stuff they do. Okay, so yeah, they got off the ground in the end, which is, by the way, I think a really nice metaphor for game development in general, one that I'll use continuously in the future. But a bit more about today's agenda in detail. I would like to start out just introducing Bad Piggies, what it is, for the benefit of those who haven't had the chance to try it out yet. Talk a bit about uh, how we came to create a game like this, how we decided to do a game about the piggies. Scattered throughout will be some hints about how and why we chose the technology. It's more mundane than you probably hope for. And uh, then I'm going to go quickly over the kind of prototyping phases we had and a bit about the production, how we came to actually launch Bad Piggies in the end. There are a couple of lessons, actually positive this time, that I want to share, pick out from, from that process. Then going to hand over to Mauricio, who's going to go into much more detail on the actual design and creation process. And we would really like to end the day today by showcasing some of the coolest new stuff from our community. I think, you know, working on Bad Piggies, most likely the biggest reward has been seeing our fans really get excited about the game, really get engaged with it, and start taking to a level that we honestly could not even have imagined while we were creating it. We have this kind of a joke inside the studio that Bad Piggies is almost like um, like a prototyping platform for all kinds of games, which sounds a bit, I don't know, maybe a bit hubristic, but I hope you'll see a bit of what I mean by the end of this presentation. 
And before we start, just a big hat tip to the game team. As you probably saw in the kind of trailer credits, whenever we launch a game at Rovio, there's a huge number of people involved from all kinds of uh, departments and specialties, animation, marketing, products, lots of people. But uh, the core game teams are actually not always huge. And in this instance specifically, we were able to take the game through prototype and launch with quite a compact team. And there's a reason for that, which you can probably guess at, but uh, again, more on that a bit later. And now onto the game. So there's, here it is in a nutshell, roughly 30 seconds. So there's really only three things you need to know about bad piggies. They want the eggs, okay, so that's thing zero. But then the point is that you need to build things in order to get to the goal. That's fairly simple. <laughs> Sometimes a bit of uh, outside-the-box thinking is required. And a very important point, even when you fail, chances are you're having quite a fun time. So that's what we were aiming for, and I think we are quite happy with where we ended up. The game today, after the first initial updates, has uh, four episodes sporting 120 levels of the kind you just saw there, and 30 extra challenge levels, which you can unlock by earning stars in the regular ones. Challenge levels are kind of a bit longer, larger, have a bit more gadgets and require a bit more thinking maybe also to get through. There's also nine sandbox environments. Uh, Mauri is going to talk a bit more about what that means, but in very simple terms, those are just like playgrounds where you have lots of gadgets, open space, and you can basically just try things out, fly around, experiment with the building and the flying. There are star boxes to collect, but really there is no end condition. It is all about free play. And the latest addition in a recent update, we added racing levels. Really came about as a kind of a, sort of an idea from the community. We saw people starting to do racing inside the sandboxes and using video to you know, time it. And uh, we figured we try out what happens if we actually try and support that a bit more. We added timing, we added time-based stars, and then leaderboards even beyond the third star, so you can compete with your friends or, or even globally if you want. But, but let's go back a bit about how we decided to do, do this game. And this is, personally, this is very important to me because I think this speaks a lot about how we at Rovio like to think about games. We, we think about games as, as a form of entertainment, very specifically. And at Rovio, we are actually all about creating very strong, long-lasting entertainment experiences for our players. And one of the ways we like to do that is to focus on characters. And in 2011, when we were thinking about this, uh, we obviously had a lot of uh, characters that were quite, quite well-developed already and quite popular. But there was one group in particular that didn't maybe, hadn't maybe received the kind of love, could have, and that was the piggies. We had a number of products out at that point, plushies, t-shirts, books, that kind of thing, also for the piggies. And we were already kind of starting to realize that uh, a lot of our fans actually were identifying quite strongly with the pigs, some even way more than with the birds. So we started thinking, what if we gave the pigs their turn? What if the piggies had their own game? And what would that look like? And do we have any ideas? And um, turns out we did. And here is an image from the original pitch in 2011 for a piggy game. Uh, I, I think you can see some familiar elements in here. <laughs> and that is certainly true. The idea was very simple. Pigs like to build things and they want to go for the eggs. So they're going to build things that will take them to the eggs. Very simple. Here's an other image, the build mode. Here I, can, I think you can start to see even more resemblance to what eventually came out. And that is, yeah, that is a, one of the characteristics of this project. The kind of core idea, the core concept, has been very consistent focused throughout, from the initial idea all throughout to launch. There are a couple of things you, here you might notice if you know the game that didn't end up <laughs> in the final one. Uh, explicit power transmission, for example. We figured pretty early on that that was unnecessary complication. But also, as you can see, some of the art actually ended up in the final. That's just the way Marcus likes to operate. And you know, as a producer, I have nothing against that. If you want to do final art in the concept pitch, go right ahead. I love that. And another one, uh, sketching a bit uh, the gameplay and the motivation. And here you can already also see that from very early on, I think, the focus was on both 
the building mechanic uh, and the challenges associated with that, and then piloting the craft through the levels. And here you can see some initial thoughts on what kind of challenges we thought we could throw at the players. So this was what we went to basically initial prototype with, because we felt this was quite promising. And well, the, um, the, the first question you have to answer is, well, is it fun? Or in this, clay, this case, does it fly? And uh, to answer that, we had to do just a few things. Basically implement some of the initial gadget set, uh, get a way to put those together somehow, put it in a physical world, add some eggs, and you know, hand it to people and see if they liked it. There's some di direct controls at that point. You could just tap directly on the gadgets. That's still in there, actually. Uh, we chose Unity for this uh, prototype, uh, basically because somebody had heard about it and it looked interesting and we wanted to check it out. I wish there was like a more systematic reason for it, but there isn't. Turned out to be a pretty fortunate choice, too. We actually had to... Oh, I want to show you just a very quick look. This is something in between the first and the second prototype. Speed it up eight times and silent because it was so long ago. But um, I, think, I think you can see already a lot of the elements there. And um, so we actually had to put it to sleep for a bit because we did needed all the guys for something else at that point. But then in early 2012, we were able to take it up again. And by that point, we were already thinking, could we launch a game in 2012 with this idea? And so the questions for the kind of second round of prototyping became much more pragmatic and maybe more product oriented. So can we build a game around this idea? How do we score it? How do we bring the three stars in there? That was very important for us. We wanted to make sure all our AgriBirds fans felt very comfortable with the, with the setting. Had to do some stuff on the in-flight controls, ended up with the buttons because it was too hard to hit the gadgets themselves with the contraption moving. There's a, quite a bit of logic going on under there. But, uh, and of course, most importantly, try to start and focus on the actual gadget set we wanted to go out with. What kind of gadgets do we want to provide to the player? What kind of contraptions can they create? What kind of challenges can we throw at them? And by extension, what kind of levels do we want to then be making for them? And at the same time, there was like a secondary track. By, by the first prototype, we pretty much realized that Unity is a huge productivity booster. It, the, the increased cycle time that we saw was just really amazing enabling a really, really small core team to work really rapidly in iterating and tuning the gameplay. So that was a huge boon. But at this point, we were starting to look, okay, so could we actually go into production with this? And the main questions we had to answer was, we have this set of services we need, uh, stuff like analytics, you know, ads, uh, IAP providers for all the channels we were thinking about. Can we actually plug those into Unity? And again, it turned out we can, and reasonably easily, if you don't ask <laughs> Mauri or the programmers, but uh, in the bigger context of it. And so we actually uh, managed to solve most of this, some of it honestly just on paper, but, um, but we figured out, figured out a lot of it, um, uh, the starting mechanics and, and everything. Mauri can talk a bit more about that later, maybe. And then we were able to go into production. That was mid-May when the prototype was green-lighted. And by that time, we already knew that we want to go out at the end of September. So we had a pretty aggressive time timetable for the production. The, the first, time, first thing we did actually was finalize and uh, even freeze the set of gadgets we wanted to go out with. And that was an interesting thing. I'll talk a bit about that later, but um, it turned out to be very useful. Uh, then we had about a whole of a month for ourselves to create everything else. The UI, we did a bit of a custom UI system. We did look at some plugins, but uh, basically we ended up with our own. Um, uh, scoring, uh, all the menu flows, all the main game modes. And once we had most of that somehow in hand, we were able to go into full-blown level production roughly at the end of June. We managed to even take some vacation time in July, and then towards the end of August, we reached beta. And we were able to go live at the end of September 27. And, and looking at this, um, we, we basically, we, well, we felt this was a pretty good achievement. It was a new kind of game for us. It was a new technology, and we, were, we managed to put it out in fairly good order 
in a fairly short amount of time and with quite a compact team. So we, we started figuring out and looking back, so what made this actually possible? And uh, there's a couple of things I'd li like to highlight. Uh, but the first thing, of course, you cannot do this without an absolutely kick-ass team, which was featured earlier here. You have to have really, really senior people who know what they're doing. And then probably all of this later stuff is pretty moot, but I'll try anyway. So the first thing I would actually like to highlight is that in this project and for us, kind of we went very early on into a very, very aggressive kind of time boxing mode. And uh, that was a bit of a scary thing. The first thing we applied this to was actually the gadget set. We actually told ourselves, OK, let's take two weeks, let's finalize everything, do any additional ones we need, balance and tweak everything, have them look the final. And at the end of two weeks, that's what we will go with. Or if not, then we, the project will simply fail. There's no time then to do levels, because you really need this to be settled for full-blown level productions to, to start, for example. And it turned out surprisingly well, <laughs> which is why I'm telling you this. I wouldn't if it didn't. Uh, but, um, and there were some other things, uh, flight controls, like I mentioned, we only solved that on paper in the Proto uh, in the second week of June. Build palette, which does not mean only the kind of UI, but also actually the ways you can connect pieces to each other. Um, and then the full kind of game flow through all the modes, rewards everything on the, uh, on the second to last week. And then we were able to start level production around the 22nd. With something that we felt at that time quite comfortably that it would not change that much. We really did not have the time to backtrack on any of the level creation, for example. So I, I have a bit of a demonstration here, which I hope proves the point, but um, it actually did turn out well, even though it was very scary at the time. Uh, the picture on the left is from May 25, uh, 2012, so about a year ago. Uh, on the day we froze the gadget set, so I sent this screen cap of all the gadgets in a single contraption around the office to mark the milestone. And the video on the right is taken actually uh, this Sunday uh, with the latest build and has a very similar contraption and all the same gadgets in there. As you can see, it still kind of works. There's one small difference you may be able to spot because the uh, current Build of Dreams uh, sandbox doesn't have a tall enough uh, build grid, but uh, other than that, works great. And, well, the second thing is obviously Unity. Um, I, I thought really hard, <coughs> tried to find out a really, really insightful thing to say here, and I, 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 I just failed miserably. There's <laughs> the explanation is pretty mundane, and I guess that is a point in itself. It's a pretty lame point, but uh, uh, fast cycle time. Making an, a change in your game and seeing it in a very short amount of time. I'm, I'm talking about seconds counting. This is where Unity excels, and we felt it right from the start of the first prototype, and it carried us through pretty much the whole production. Uh, other, of course, other tool chains engines do it, but I think Unity is very competitive here. And actually, I think there's a really, really wonderful <laughs> event happened in the keynote yesterday. I don't know if you were there, but uh, turns out the most popular uh, feature in the upcoming 4.2 update is by far, and measured by audience reaction, the cancel button in the build progress bar. And I think that's exactly what I'm talking about here, because when you click that to cancel a build you didn't want, you're saving time by that click. And well, I think that works for the whole system pretty much. And I'm also very happy to see the Unity guys actually continuously focusing on that single thing as well, as we saw yesterday, so that's beautiful. Uh, the other thing was, of course, uh, multi-platform. We obviously would like the platform support to be even wider, but uh, with the ones they do support, we, we found that we could actually rely on that pretty heavily. Uh, so we could actually honestly call it kind of a push-button solution for that. We did take advantage of the asset store a bit for some of the integrations. It did save us a lot of time uh, in this context, but honestly, I don't think we really came close to using the full potential of it. And then again, it was also growing at that time pretty fast. So that's definitely something going forward we want to take a, take a look at. Um, some obvious next step. Again, I'm going to end up with platitudes. <laughs> 
but the uh, uh, thing we're already doing is really, really going systematically through the uh, asset store, figuring out what is there, what is useful to us, aggressively and actively evaluating stuff. Uh, if you know stuff that is interesting, please <laughs> let me know. If you want to know what we use, please come and ask in the QA and so on. So uh, that, that we view as really, really essential going forward with Unity. And uh, another obvious point, more allocation for in-editor tool development. We did some small stuff, most notably, I guess, our Sprite pipeline uh, that we had an ed editor extension for. It helped enormously but we hadn't really budgeted any time for that. So it kind of came out as an ad hoc thing that we did just because we absolutely had to. So in the future, going forward, we're definitely going to plan for some more of that. The productivity increases in content production. If you can do custom tools per game, that, that looks like a really, really promising thing. And with that, I'm actually going to hand over to Mauri. Thank you, Jakob. Yes. So, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us and actually staying for the whole talk. Doesn't happen all the time. Um, as Jaco said, I would uh, go a little bit more into detail on the design and the actual development of the project. Due to time constraints, uh, I'm keeping the talk in a very high level. I know people don't like that that much sometimes. But if you want to hear anything else, we're going to be around. We have a lot of examples in the laptop, and you can come, come and check them out with us. Um, so I'll go first through uh, three core principles that we use in our studio when we're making uh, new games or updates. I'll explain how those principles affected the early design decisions of, of this project in particular, the main conflicts that we got out of those decisions, and the main approach that we, we use to tackle these conflicts. Finally, I'll go through some lessons learned during the process. So the three principles. First, we like that our games have a story to tell. And we like telling this story not only through cutscenes and animations, but actually making all the parts of the game consistently tell the same story and, and kind of speak with the same tone to the user. And in this project in particular, it was very interesting because we were introducing the, the piggies, which uh, from the first game, pretty much everything people knew was that they built stuff and they, they wanted the X. But from the launch of the first Angry Birds till when we were actually working on this, we kind of saw this a spontaneous evolution on, on their character of, 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 of the pigs. So from, from this very simple thing that we introduced to the users, they have become well, quite a lot more. Now they were being seen as dreamers, explorers, even pioneers. And if you see that they're always really happy and cheerful and playful, even when they're, when they're failing. Actually, I think it's, if you notice, you, you rarely see them angry, the peaks. Uh, second principle is to delight the fan. And by that we understand to surprise them in new ways with every update or, or game. So kind of give something they're expecting, but a little bit of unpredicted stuff there. So, so there's a wall effect, hopefully. And with this game in particular, we wanted to put that in a lot of freedom for the users to express themselves and even start telling their own stories within the Bad Piggies universe. I think that was one of the main uh, goals of the, of the team. Um, and it worked out pretty well. And finally, we, we want our games to be approachable. And by that, we just mean that we ask a very little investment in terms of time from the user before they can start feeling comfortable with the application. So it's, it just shouldn't take them more than five minutes, even if they are failing, to, to feel that they're in control and, and it's safe to, to play around with, with the app. Um, so. If you think about that, I just said that on one side, we wanted to introduce a great amount of freedom so the player could do a lot of stuff there. But we also wanted the game to be very approachable so they wouldn't invest too much time before they, they felt in control. And I think that you can safely say that there's a relationship between these two. 
Um, because the more freedom you give to, to the player in the beginning of, of the game, the more options they have. So bigger chances they'll make a series of bad decisions that they'll I'll put them in a, in a position that they'll have a bad first experience. And I think they're going to blame us for that because we gave them the cho choice to end up there. So I think you, you can have something kind of looking like this. More freedom, you, re you reach a point where there's pretty much no, no approachability anymore. And, and well, with the lack of freedom, it just becomes uh, very boring, almost not a game anymore. And what we wanted to do, of course, was kind of find a good initial spot, not, not too boring, not, not too challenging, and then walk the player along that line until they reach uh, kind of the sweet spot where the magic happens and they could get the whole potential of the game. And of course, it's easier saying it than actually doing it in, in the context of a real game. So when I was preparing the presentation on the weekend, I started thinking about some sandbox games that I played and started thinking about how they tackle this approachability versus freedom uh, in their own context. So on, on the left, uh, top left, we have Universe Sandbox, also done with Unity. Um, don't know if you played the game. In that game, you, you, you can play with the universe, crush uh, stars, and so on. And it's, it's, it's amazing what you can do with that, but there's very little guidance from the game. It can be quite intimidating in the beginning. So yeah, that's not really where we wanted to go. On the other side, you have games like uh, GTA and Skyrim, which introduce complete freedom almost from the beginning. Although I think uh, the freedom in those games is more in terms of space meaning there is an open world that the player can explore in pretty much at any given order. But if you think about the, uh, those games, uh, the core mechanics of the game don't really evolve through the gameplay, meaning you start uh, in GTA, you might get faster cars, you might get bigger guns and so on, but the actions that the player perform are pretty much the same through the experience, and it's the same in Skyrim, even though it's quite more complex, but more spells, more armors, this, the experience doesn't really change through, through the gameplay. And last, we have uh, games like um, Banjo Kazooie, Nuts and Bolts, uh, Little Big Planet, and Amazing Alex. In, in these three games, there's kind of a very definite two phases to the game. There's one very linear phase where they teach the player, they, they take them uh, on their hand along the experience. And then there's another phase where they try to give uh, as much freedom as, as they can to the player. And they, they all do it in their own different ways. But I think that's, that's pretty much where, where bad piggies uh, would, would fall. So let's go through what uh, bad piggies looks like. Uh, as, as Jaco mentioned earlier, we have a linear phase where we would teach uh, the player the basics of, of, of the game, make them feel comfortable to, to keep on playing and, and experiment on their own. And then the sandbox phase where we really wanted to, to give the whole potential of the game there for the player to, to enjoy. Uh, so let's, let's go through those in a little bit more detail. So the linear phase, uh, I think Jaco showed this example. So you can see the building grid is, is quite small. Uh, there's not that many amounts of pieces, so not many combinations. Uh, pretty much the player can, can fail a few times, one, one or twice before realizing uh, what's supposed to be done there. There's smaller levels, very clear challenges, and the challenges are quite linked to these pieces and their functionality, so the player really learns a lot about each individual piece, what's their properties, how can I use them, uh, and so on. And then on the other side, uh, the sandbox has a very big grid. Pretty much any, any combinations of pieces are possible there. So there's, there's a lot of experimentation going on there. It feels a little bit more like a toy than, than an actual uh, guided experience. The levels are quite bigger. There's still challenges. Uh, those numbers are the actual goals that the player can uh, acquire in the, in the level. But uh, there's not that much emphasis put in, 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 the, in getting these goals uh, as, as in the linear gameplay. Uh, also, the, the goals are 
as you can see, very scattered around. So there's a lot of focus on exploration. Uh, there's quite big spaces in the level. So uh, we wanted to give the player big areas so that they can really experiment around with, with whatever creations they would they would make. And of course, that, that would lead to you know bigger, crazier crea creations, uh, some of which were quite unpredictable for us from the start. And if you think about it, uh, there's two core differences, or there's some core differences between these two types of gameplays and games that put emphasis on the first one or on the other one or, or marry complete, completely with one approach. Uh, main thing on the linear phase, we have very constrained scenarios. As designers, we have a lot of control over the content as it will be presented to the player. So it, it's easy if something doesn't work, we can just you know change it to another level. Don't, don't let these two pieces be together because it might fail. And on the other side, you have on the sandbox level, pretty much anything can happen. You, you can't really predict what's going to go on in there. And more, more than that, in the, in the linear phase, uh, we wanted very specific puzzles and challenges. And these this kind of puzzles uh, need systems that respond the same way to similar situations. And I say similar there uh, because with physics games, I'm sure you know, uh, the physics simulation has a way broader range of values than what the player can actually see. So, for example, this is a, a one level where the player had to just go around that loop with a little car with four wheels. But if it went too fast, then the pieces could break and so on. So, in the, in the physics system, uh, a different amount of speed going in there, it, it would be really Quite a coincidence if, if the player tries two or three times and the speed is just actually the same or, or the angle that is uh, approaching to that exit point there is the same. But most of the time it does look the same to the player. So we want it to have exactly the same reaction. It should be a positive outcome or they wouldn't understand what's going on. It, it breaks the immersion. And when we're trying to design this type of, of puzzles, it's very easy because, as I said before, we have so much control over the content. It's easy to fall in and, and kind of perform some tricks there to, to make things work. Um, and I think by a, by a rule of thumb, the, the more tricks you, you keep adding to a system like this uh, that's going to go kind of completely free and, and be in a sandbox environment, uh, the bigger chances you, you end up in, in ended up in a bad situation and having lots of troubles. Um, actually, what, one example to, to explain what I mean with that of, of little tricks. Uh, I remember we had a prototype at work. Uh, we were trying to make this little object. Uh, it should attach to the first object it touched. To, so in the collision enter, we would put in the first collision, we would create a joint and attach the, the object to, to whatever it touched. And what happened was that it moved really fast before that collision. And when we attached the joint, uh, it would just behave a little bit crazy because there was too much speed in the body when attaching the joint and so on. And somebody decided that a good solution for this was to set the body kinematic for like a split of a second and then set it back to, to well, not, not kinematic, and put the joint there, which worked when, when you do it by itself. But then there's another uh, piece of, of gameplay that there's the TNT box, it explodes, and whatever rigid bodies in the area goes flying away. And of course, that created the bug that if, if the TNT box exploded at that split of the second where they set the object kinematic, uh, first of all, of all, it would cr actually create a, an error, because we were trying to apply a force to, to a kinematic object. And it would break the immersion completely, because an object that used to fly away is not flying anymore. So just breaks. And, and that's just a very, very simple example. But I'm sure there, there's a lot more. Uh, so what approach, what, what, how do we try to manage this in, with so, so strict uh, time constraints? <coughs> First of all, I know it sounds uh, very simple. 
uh, but we try to stick with uh, very simple and close modular systems. We try to represent the principles of the game through, through very simple independent systems. So, so they could be tweaked, they could be even sent to a different project and used for a completely different game, and, and they wouldn't break. Uh, so let, let's go through those, the, the main principle in, in the design of the game. We have simple modular pieces with one clear functionality, and those should lead to very easy identifiable creations. And well, the first one deals with the actual physical contraption, a uh, bunch of pieces attached together in, in, in this little car. Uh, and the second one actually deals with what those pieces actually do. And uh, well, the third one is a little bit more art oriented. It depends on the visual of those pieces, of course. And let's go through those close, close systems. So the first one is a contraption system, which handles all the building parts. It handles uh, the player building the, the contraption in the build, and then it, it handles the contraption staying together through the gameplay, through the game. And, and the pieces actually break in and, and so on. Um, and the types of, of categories, uh, pieces we have in this are the frames, which form the, the body of the car. That's the main structure. Then we have internal pieces that the player can put inside frames. There's external pieces that they go attached to one side of the frame. And then there's except, uh, not really even exceptions, but uh, cases to this. So the external pieces can have a, a fixed joint or they could have a different kind of joint. So there's like a rope, like the balloons are, are joined by, it seems like a rope joined to the, to the contraption. And some of them can have multiple frames, so double frames, one, one up, one down, and, and so on. But the important thing here is that this system, the contraption, all it's really handling is a bunch of boxes, a bunch of uh, cubes and cylinders and wheel colliders joined together. And it, it's not caring at all what they do or what they don't do. And well, that, that works uh, really, really well if, 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 if a piece breaks, we can just take that one out, uh, change it for something else. Don't, don't worry about the contraption system, especially when we were always updating uh, the game. As Jack was said, uh, we time box uh, the, the gadgets for the first release, and that was uh, very successful. But we also had to think that uh, this was a game that was going to keep being updated. So new gadgets would come into play. and, and it was very hard to predict. Even now, it's hard to predict where is the game going to be in one year from now? Where, where do we want to take it? So we wanted to leave it really open. Uh, after the game is out there, we add a new piece. Uh, we, we can't have that breaking all the previous levels or actually tweaking any of the pieces anymore. Then we have the part system or gadget system. I can change that. Um, and this one actually handles the behavior of, of, of those pieces, uh, the actual functionality of, of the piece. So we have some pieces that have a passive behavior. It's, it comes intrinsically from their physical properties. Like the, the wheels just have a wheel collider so they can roll around. Uh, the airplane pieces have very specific kind of drag to them and, and very specific properties. So we can create the, the airplane loop uh, for the player um, and so on. There's uh, one-shot pieces, which the player can uh, activate. There's uh, the button. And simply what happens is when the player presses the button, a function gets called in the piece, and it performs the action. So uh, every piece is, is quite modular. And as you can see, those pieces can be, in terms of the contraption, uh, any kind of piece. They can be internal pieces. They could even be frames. They could go outside. It doesn't really matter for the functionality, and it shouldn't. Then we have switch states, which is really similar to the, to the one shot. Uh, the one shot, after the player uses them, it, it gets disabled. The switch states just have a toggable function, so it just keeps calling that function, in this case with the umbrella. It's similar to one of those passive behavior pieces. It just changes its it physical properties, so it will change the behavior of the contraption as it's moving, um, mostly by adding drag. So, so the drag in the, in, the, in the right place, if you put the umbrella to the side, it'll make the, the uh, contraption go around and so on. 
Then we have a uh, switch on off pieces, which very very similar to the switch states. Instead of just calling one function, there's uh, either a loop on the update or there's a coroutine which gets called while they're on, and it just keeps performing this action. Um, most of them are just adding a force uh, to, to the rigid body. And over this, we have then the engine system, um, which is, again, completely separate from the gadget system and the contraption system. And all, all this says is that there's some types of gadgets that need energy, and there's some types of gadgets that provide energy. <coughs> and that pretty much, uh, what that means is this, uh, this gadgets that need energy need an engine to be present in the in the contraption so they can so they can get activated and then there's just pretty much a value to the to the engine that serves as a multiplier for these pieces to use for whatever purpose they're going to use it so if again usually what we're doing is adding a force so depending on the engine the force is, is bigger or, or smaller but it could be pretty much anything uh, this behavior because it's it's again just one function where where the the actual action happens <coughs> and that actually as, as simple as it sounds I, I think those those systems are quite 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 simple quite modular not not it's, wasn't very hard to to debug them uh, when we got troubles in the in the sandbox it, it was very easy for designers to tweak them in time for the levels and not keep going in that loop where you tweak one level and it breaks the other one and, and so on. And it would lead to actually quite crazy contraptions and whoop, situations, uh, some of them which we couldn't have predicted even ourselves. And finally, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some lessons learned. And in this, uh, I'll put it in the context of deciding to use Unity for this one first project for us, a very important project, uh, that actually being successful, and then from that taking Unity for multiple prototypings in the company, in, in different studios, uh, and, and so on, and, uh, and how that experience was for me in particular. Um, so biggest lesson, and probably only lesson if you, if you want to take one is to focus on reusability. Um, and by that I mean, I think because Unity is so approachable, it's easy to feel safe when you start using Unity, especially if you come from something else. It, it's, it almost feels like a toy that you just want to go in and, and start playing and doing stuff right away. And I think it's easy to make the mistake when you're prototyping of going right away, uh, having a proof of concept by the end of the day and or, or by the end of the week, and that might work really well if, if you maybe have a small team, if you're only trying to go for this one concept that you're trying to prove. <coughs> but if you actually have uh, a larger team, if you have different prototypes, different prototyping teams, or if you're even planning to, to just prototype for, for quite a while in different projects, I think uh, Unity offers us quite a few options to extend it in, in whatever way we want it and go out from the vanilla version and creating our own Unity version that, that we feel very comfortable with and that especially we can empower everybody on the team to give an input at the right time. So you don't have the typical designer programmer pair where the designer really wants to start concepting the game and, and working on it but they're having to wait for, for the programmer to do the, the basic and, and bootstrapping and, and so on. <coughs> so just a few examples of stuff that I've, I've found on, on different projects that it, it's perfectly reusable. You can build system around them. Um, so audio manager, it's very typical that we, we have that in the game. It handles all the actual instancing of, of the audio and the playing and so on and channels. And that's something that is quite common between projects is it's not really bound to, to change unless you're, you're making an audio-specific game. Uh, editor extensions, of course, all kinds of editor extensions. 
Then uh, for us specifically in the Bad Pig is we made a, a 2D sprite system similar to NGUI if you, if you used it. Um, it's pretty much, it has an atlasing system, so we can do atlases and sprite sheets. <coughs> and it's just a component in the, that, w that we can add to the object. And then uh, it pretty much lets us select a side of the, of the texture that we want to use and so on. We save draw calls, they're sharing the same texture. And that's a, a perfectly re reusable system that uh, if we're focusing on 2D games, it, it, it was good to keep on. Uh, frame animation system works over the, the 2D sprite system, pretty much just to go over one texture and, and changing the actual part of the texture that, that you're displaying. Um, instance manager, just to properly handle um, creating objects on the fly so we don't have to keep reserving uh, memory all the time. So this is something I, I'm, I'm sure you're, you've seen before. And it, it's something that I've seen that kept being done from scratch in, in, in prototyping and in different projects. And it's things that you could build a library out of, especially, again, if, if you have bigger teams that, that they will see the benefit out of this. Um, a few other camera scripts, that's a pretty obvious one. The base classes for mono behavior. This is another one I've seen in, in almost every project, a Unity project, is that typically people have their own project class, like we had in Bat Piggy's, uh, Bat Piggy's mono behavior or something like that. And all of your mono behaviors would, or would inherit from that instead of, Bat Piggy, uh, of, of mono behavior because you have uh, shared, shared instances there. Typically, you would find uh, references to the transform and the rigid body, so you know you you could optimize on that. Uh, a reference to the game manager, which is another typical thing you have there, a single tone, maybe just in a, in one game object. <coughs> but then then again, it's it's stuff that keeps getting repeated through through prototypes, and and especially if you if you're trying to prove a concept to somebody, so it's not only prototyping for your own sake, but you actually have to present it and, and well, prove the concept. So you have to make it kind of pretty. And, well, finally, prefabs. Uh, level layouts, for, especially for, for prototyping both 3D and 2D games, a lot can be saved from just keeping very basic layouts for, for testing purposes also, not even uh, prototyping gameplay features, but just physical physics tests and... and uh, memory tests and, and so on. Um, this is, again, something that we don't need to build from scratch every time. Um, well, placeholder, art placeholders and, and so on. And compound physics objects as well. Uh, well, with that, I just mean ropes, bridges, gates, all, all, all this kind of stuff is, is things that, especially if you're doing physics games, uh, I'm sure you, you you see them again and again, like the balloon and the, the rope, and they just keep appearing. And it's, it's actually quite easy to focus on, on making those quite robust and just sharing them through, through the teams and giving them the chance to, to actually use it on, on their own way. And with that, we are ready for the community yes, talk. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a bit of time, so I would just quickly like to share with you a quick collection shamelessly ripped from the web of the best of the latest community. First of all, Pigeoneering, our absolute favorite site. We simply love the stuff that is on there. And then more later edition, we just added in a recent update, every play video sharing. So more kind of um, more widespread community sharing. So some highlights from that taken just a few days ago. Hope you guys enjoy it. Like I said, these guys do stuff that we honestly did not foresee. <laughs> like attitude control with the king pig. I 
figured I was going to do some over-the-top contraptions as examples, and then, then I figured, why bother, basically, because I'm never going to be able to top this. Stable flight contraptions was something we realized you could do at some point, but again, taking it pretty far. And another thing was uh, multi-part vehicles. We kind of knew we could do that. That was one of the points where we realized we really had something. But um, then what you could do with that actually is uh, <laughs> quite amazing, I think. Players were way ahead of us on this one. That one with the dynamite and the balloon is yeah. one that I, th I don't think we ever saw it coming. No. Nor this one really, but... <laughs> I don't know how many takes they did for that. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, the more recent every play integration. <laughs> so you can actually make a Street Fighter. <laughs> it's a bit rough, but... <laughs> Formation flying. Could be big in Japan. <laughs> Bit of the darker side. <laughs> and this, my favorite, goes really on the artistic side, I think. It's a bird. <laughs> there. 
I think these guys deserve the biggest applause. <laughs> and since we have five minutes, I mean, do you guys want to see one thing more? Yes, no, maybe. It's kind of busy. Okay, so I'm going to show one thing more um, because everything we told you guys just now is bullshit. This is how we really did it. <laughs> I feel this project redefines the concept for casual game development. This is where ambition and innovation shake hands. The world of pigs is the perfect setting for a pioneering project like this. This is what I call the new green wave. What we're doing is creating a library of pig animations using motion capture. Every single pig movement that appears in every level of the game was created by motion capture actors moving in our studio. The most difficult part is to get the actors in the right state of mind so they can deliver on the important scenes. Of course, for me, every scene is an important scene. Right. Neck first. The director said to me, uh, life is not about how fast you run or how high you climb. It's how well you bounce. It's about optimism. Safety. Yeah. It's not in a pig's nature to question things. They are essentially creatures of action. Building an emotional connection between the gamer and our characters is our primary goal. That's why we use emotion capturing. Revolution? No, this is an era of innovation. Sure, there are times I have my doubts, but then I look in the mirror and I say, I'm a bad piggy. Bad piggies never give up. Thank you, guys. That was it for us. Thank you. Okay, I guess there's a sort of a QA session. I heard it was at the round bar, maybe. So we'll be there. Yes. Any questions you have, please come and ask. We'll try and answer. We have a lot of uh, stuff to show on the laptop and so on. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>